And I think it's a really pivotal election for our area. Uh, we've got a council in at the moment and a, and a local member that are hell bent on developing everything they can get their hands on. Um, it seems to be their focus, so whether it be uh, short stay accommodation on the beachfront in uh, Bustleton, kiosks as a priority in, uh, in Dunsborough here, um, money for poor geograph, those things seem to find the focus, but uh, when it comes to um, finding services for the people who live here, um, that seems to take a second priority when it comes to looking after the environment. That comes secondary to getting more houses on the ground and more suburbs built. And it's, and it's also the manner in which they're doing it. We're seeing a lot of urban sprawl happening down here. We're not seeing, um, what we'd hate to see is four more new, say, town sites with large spread of housing, but without the services, without the facilities and just wrecking our environment at the same time. We can have, you know, more houses built, but it can be done in a way that we, I suppose, maintain the character of our area here. And that's something we're not seeing. We're starting to see the character of our area eaten away with this uh, extra growth. And that's, that's what I want to bring to the table at this election, is raising those concerns. Um, services are certainly one that other candidates are bringing up as well, and it's a common theme running through this election. So that's, that is what I see as the key issues. Um, there are a couple of issues which have, um, I suppose, why I got involved with the Greens and um, and doing what I'm doing. I suppose it started with the bustle of the hospital, which kind of um, is a classic example of all those things which have happened. Um, we've got a hospital which is built too close to the beachfront. It doesn't take into account the issues of uh, climate change and sea level rise. Uh, involved the destruction of quite a lot of our natural habitat within on that site, and I know. You know, I've just heard that the, a lot of the possums which were translocated have, have died. So there was no environment, you know, there was a negative environmental outcome on that, on that one. And for the sake of, well, what do we get for it? We actually lost services. Um, we were promised chemotherapy. We're not getting it. Um, we were going to have co-located aged care. We're not getting it. Um, there was also the room for expansion. We've got a shire who says, we're going to have 60,000 people living here in the next few decades and we're on a site that we can't expand on. So again, lots of people, but people have got to live here and, and we're not getting the infrastructure to live here. Um, there's also other issues which are coming up. Um, I'm the PNC president of the local primary school. Um, we, we were, we're in our school, which on a site which was, I suppose, ideally for 350, 400 students, we've hit 700, or just under 700. Um, we're running out of space for kids to even play on at that school. We've got no parking, and we've even got an issue now where we're trying to get out as a school board, trying to get kids on to using computers in the classroom. We've got, it's called megabits per second in our bandwidth. We've got two. Other schools in Bustle have ten. We get 15 kids on a computer, the system goes down. So we can't even provide the education opportunities at our school that our other schools, even in this electorate, are getting. And when we've asked about it, we're getting, I think, $5. Um, we'll get a technician set down, all this stuff. They know what the issue is. They just need to provide us with the facilities that we need to educate our kids. Yet, on the other hand, let's get a new airport and get more people down here. You know? um, that's why I said it. And then we also look at stuff like uh, an entertainment centre. When I grew up down here, um, when we were going to primary school even, we used to go into the Civic Centre in Bustleton. Um, that's where you have your puppet shows and all our events. i have been to weddings there. They've closed the Civic Centre because it's been expanded in Shire offices. Nothing's replaced that. We don't have a facility in Bustleton now that we even had 30 years ago for those public events. Um, in a classic case, even for my family, we have um, tap dance concerts. City of Bustleton, nowhere to go. We go to Margaret River or we go to Bunbury for our tap dance, tap dance concerts. So again, just not the facilities here. So if you want to live in the community, you're just not getting here what you would expect for a place that actually calls itself a city. Um, and we've also got a few other issues of social issues. Um, rental prices is certainly one that's affecting a lot of people. We, we're finding families leaving here now because they can't get a place to rent. Um, people who are involved in, you know, I know at our school and a lot of community stuff, who are leaving. Um, they just can't get their rentals. Um, yet at the same time we're getting a lot of houses built but not for people who live here. And again, it, it, I suppose it's the frustration of the council who thinks the priority is short-term accommodation 
despite the fact that we've got an occupancy rate in short-term mm. accommodation during the year getting down to 30 per cent, yet not seeing that we've got an issue about um, housing affordability. So again, it's to do with priorities, just what's important down there. And one last one I'll touch on is, um, is development on our coastline. And uh, one thing that concerns me down the future is the possibility of um, further development in uh, Meal Up Reserve. Um, it's something that the community has rejected continuously over the last decade. Um, and the Shire in uh, minutes have stated that, yeah, they're looking at uh, putting a new boat ramp facility, which is not just a boat ramp, it'll be a marina, um, because they need a break water because of the swell conditions up there. Um, again, there are other options, but they seem determined to do that. And why are they determined to do that? You can only think, well, it creates opportunities for development, for more housing, for other things that might happen there. So again, it's, that's a, a unique part of why you live here, is to go and visit those places. The, uh, the area that's under question is Curtis Bay, and uh, Curtis Bay is a fantastic little beach. It's, it's a place where um, so many people in the morning just go down there, a quick swim, it's secluded, no one overlooks looks it, dip in, off you go. It's, it's almost a magical place for that. And to think that we might lose that um, is, is a tragedy and it would diminish the reason why you actually live down here. So mm. that's, that's one of the things we're following up. We had a, uh, there was a workshop on it. Um, it was rejected by people at the workshop in, in, in the um, assessment of it, yet it seemed to bounce back up at the end um, as an option. Mm. So it's, it's there, it's live, keep your eye on that one. Mm. That's a real concern because that park is for everyone. It's, um, you know, there are you know, a lot of sport stuff starting to happen up there, but it's, you know, as long as it's used and we can protect the environment and we can maintain it for the way we want to use it, as in a secluded place to go to and everyone can enjoy it in that way, um, that's fine. But to, uh, to whack a big road through the centre and start developing in there, that's not what people down here want. In the election, there's, there's two things we've got that are coming up which are really important. We've got the lower house election, where it's, it, I think it's really critical we have a change in member. We've also got an upper house election. So we're in, a, we're in the South First area and there are six members who are going to be elected uh, for the South West to represent us in the upper house. Last election, we didn't get a Greens representative in there. Um, this election, we're really fortunate to have uh, Giz uh, running for us in the upper house. Uh, that's going to be um, a real vital thing for us because I think it's been, we've been really fortunate because Giz has been our, uh, the member for the North Metropolitan area. Giz is actually moving to uh, back to Albany. That's where her family lives. It's where her sisters and extended family are. Um, she's going there regardless of whether she wins or loses. That's, her, that's the decision she's made. And but she does, does want to continue to represent represent us politically. Um, so it'd be fantastic because she's a local member. She's uh, very well respected amongst all all parties in Perth, and uh, her experience in the parliament is is uh, well known. Um, my involvement with Giz was through the hospital. Um, Giz was the first person who offered to ask questions on our behalf in the parliament. Um, she's asked a lot of questions to do with uh, forestry, um, the issue of the fact that we want to transition to plantation timbers for our forestry and the FPC has stopped planting plantation timbers. Um, obviously the hospital, we've looked at wetlands funding, the fact that the state government has slashed funding to our wetlands, which is the vast water up um, wetland system and we're not getting the funding we need. There's a fantastic water quality improvement plan for the vast water up wetlands and it's all laid out um, and we just need it funded properly to uh, put it into place and we're not getting that funding. So uh, as much as we get noises that oh yeah aren't we doing wonderful things, they're not funding it. It's, it's not uh, going to succeed unless it does get that funding. And the other one was on the foreshore development. We uh, Giz raised a, a uh, disallowance motion on the development of the foreshore. Um, obviously, if, for those who know, there's the Shire are planning to put um, short-term accommodation on the beachfront. It takes up a good portion of the key central area of our Class A reserves. Their Class A reserves, a lot of them, um, on our foreshore. And if you were there this morning in our fun run, it was packets. It was chockers full of cars, of people. It was full. And if you tuck that whole area out and put it into short-term accommodation, we are not going to have the space on our foreshore for what the Shire is planning, that 50 or 60,000 people coming up. So we've got to protect that public open space and not give it away. We are short of public open space. 
um, speaking to some people today with concerns about lack of ovals. We just don't we don't have enough ovals for football for a lot of our sports now, and we're giving our public open space away to developers. So again, Giz was raising those questions for us. I'd like to yeah ask Giz if you want to say some words just before I do. Um, there's a heap of brochures up on the um, table up there. Um, please free. Grab them. How like we have to have a day because that makes a huge difference. Um, I know that at booths like at Dunsborough here, we've got um, it's you know got about two and a half thousand people who vote at that, that booth. And if you've got people at booths, your vote goes up considerably. And especially if you've got local people who nothing nothing is better than having someone else handing out an open vote card for you saying, Oh look, I recommend that person, it's the best uh, recommendation you can get, and especially from someone who people know locally. So that's really important for us. So if I can now hand over to Giz. Um, look, Giz will have a short word, and um, if you've got any questions for us, and especially because Giz has got a, I suppose, one of the most enjoyable things when we have to have Greens meetings, just some of the insight of decisions that are made and the processes that go into them in the state parliament and, um, and, and what's happening there. So, Giz, if you have a word. Thanks, Michael. That was very comprehensive. What an amazing candidate you've got in Michael, um, and it's been a delight for me to get to know Michael. I mean, we started out, as, as Michael said, um, he, he contacted my office and had questions that he wanted asked about uh, the um, hospital site and uh, the impact on the possums and various things. And um, I have an excellent um, group uh, of staff who work for me. That makes it sound like a lot. There's actually two full-time staff members. <laughs> <laughs> they cover a lot of ground, but um, they're really fantastic and, and we do what we can to um, ask questions and raise issues in the Parliament. And I think it's managed to fuel some of the ongoing debate in the local media that you've been running on it. Um, <clears throat> and those answers often do that. So it's a good example of, I guess, somebody from the community, you know, saying, well, well is there somewhere in the Parliament where I can get my issues raised, that I can get these things um, addressed as much as they can be? And, and that's very much the way the Greens work. Um, we. I would argue more than any other political party understand that you've got to maintain those links with the community um, and you've got to keep in, in, in touch with issues as they come up. So it's been great and um, we were delighted that Michael um, put his hand up uh, to, to be the candidate here. And I think it's going to be a really interesting election, uh, as Michael says. Uh, if, if there's any way of, uh, of unseating uh, uh, Troy Boswell, uh, I think it's going to be a good outcome. <laughs> Nothing personal, of course. <laughs> but I mean, really do think that there is a, a need for change uh, and um, Michael is, is doing a fantastic job. My job is to try and uh, regain the uh, region, uh, get a seat for the, in the region for the Greens. And the region goes from Mandurah at the top to just east of Albany. Uh, so it's a very large area to cover. Um, but we've been uh, working hard to, to do that and um, uh, you know, are really uh, um, uh, positive about the response we're getting. Um, and I guess, uh, I don't think, I mean, the, the, <clears throat> the issues about services are, are, are replicated around the southwest. Um, there may be money coming in from autism regions, uh, and we would certainly say that that should continue, but that needs to be adjusted so it actually is about providing now they might have the infrastructure, but you don't have the psychiatrists or the uh, um, the doctors or the actual people to uh, service the growing community, and that's replicated all around the southwest. The issue of housing uh, and the lack of affordable either um, houses to buy or and certainly rental accommodation is right throughout the southwest. So there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, and Michael touched on the forest issue. There's no doubt that. Uh, there's a real push to have this election also be about finally uh, having a phase-out plan for native forest logging and move into plantation timbers. Uh, we've worked hard on the economics of that because you know I, we think this is one of the Achilles heel of the sector is that when you start to look at the finances they don't stack up uh, and I've been able to do that partly because I chair uh, one of the parliamentary committees into state finances and so we've targeted um, the uh, the whole cost of logging of native forests, not just what the FPC uh, costs are, but the cost to deck to manage it and other um, 
uh, factors. It's quite hard to get in underneath it, but we've been working hard. Um, look, I might not, I mean, I could talk about numerous issues, but I think, I, I reckon if people have questions, um, Michael and I are both more than happy to, uh, to answer questions. Um, there are other issues of running hard on uh, genetically modified um, crops is one where uh, there was a lot of anger about what's happened with GM crops in the southwest, and that's certainly coming back um, to us to say run hard on that. And we have a policy of uh, reinstating a moratorium on GM crops, um, trying to put the uh, cat back in the bag, so to speak. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> is what is like all the farmers are doing the canola now because it's so profitable? What's well, um, interestingly enough... Are they going to like you or not? Uh, well, interestingly enough, um, our candidate for Warren Blackwood, whose name's Nerily uh, Bosshammer, who uh, works with the um, South West Catchment Council and spends a lot of time talking to farmers, um, uh, says there's a lot of uh, anger in the farming community because, uh, for one, the premium that GM Canola was meant to provide isn't, uh, you know, isn't transpiring. And, in fact, if you look at the price there, they're having to sell it for, for a lower price. And this was always the argument that even, again, if you just look at the economics of it, there's a premium um, that's paid for non-GM canola. And um, because of the risk of contamination and other things, and the market uh, for GM canola is, is at a lower price. So the GM canola that has been grown, they've had trouble selling um, at, a, at you know, the price they expect. Then you've got the situation with uh, Steve Marsh, who's the farmer just out of Kojanup, who's uh, uh, his uh, organic farm was contaminated with GM canola, uh, and his only recourse was to take his neighbour, who's a you know, um, lifetime friend, to court uh, for um, for damages to his uh, um, to his income, because he can't now sell his crop uh, as non-GM. Uh, and uh, there's very strict certification. He had uh, to sell his um, crop into the ordinary market, so he uh, had a reduced income. Uh, and that court case, interesting enough, is about to come up, uh, and it'll be really uh, interesting to see how that unfolds. But I think there's a lot of anger. Um, the minister, Redmond, is seen as being cap captured by uh, the big in industrial side of agriculture. So it's not just the GM stuff. What farmers are saying is that we haven't got the support services that we used to have on farm in terms of advising us about, um, you know, choices. Um, and the research capacity in the Department of Ag has been cut to the bone. And I know that from also talking to people who work in the department. Uh, so the push is for the big end, get big, get in industrial export to China, that's where everything's going, uh, as opposed to let's grow local, high value, um, regionally identified produce uh, uh, which will uh, produce more local employment. So it's the kind of the bulk Coles Woolies end of the, of the spectrum versus uh, the more differentiated product. And one of the reasons why we've been um, distributing um, uh, the calendars that we have, promoting local markets and local producers, uh, is because there's a real sea change or real sort of watershed mm -hmm. happening mm -hmm. in terms of how the southwest will go what is the future for the southwest because the average age of a farmer in western australia anybody here know what it is mm. 58 yeah, yeah. 58 uh, and there's a crisis um, a lot of farmers uh, feeling they have to get out their kids won't stay don't want to stay on the farms there's no money in it um, but coming kind of in underneath that is this sort of whole new excitement about um, a regional identity for produce, a higher value produce, and it's happening not just in Margaret River but also in places like Manjima. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we, one of the things we're doing is is showcasing some of those new emerging businesses uh, because, you know, funnily enough, the greens aren't just about you know, kind of uh, you know, the, 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 the standard environmental issues that we are known for. We also are really interested about the future of the region and and how we continue to produce off the land in a kind of clean, green and, and um, sustainable way. That was a long answer, sorry. Who, just, <laughs> great. Who asked that question? <laughs> <laughs> is this uh, another aspect to the GM with the recruitment on roadsides? Yeah, yeah. Added high cost 
to actually try and deal with that with local shark hunters? Yeah, so that was one of the questions that was put very early on uh, when, <coughs> so in order to lift the moratorium that uh, was put in place by ourselves and the Labor Party, basically the legislation, the law says that you can't grow GM crops in Western Australia. And the only way you can grow GM crops in Western Australia is if the uh, Parliament um, grants an exemption. And the exemption could be, you know, for a 10 hectare size or it could be for the whole state. And what the uh, Liberal Nationals did is um, bring that e exemption in. So that's why you can grow canola, whatever you want now. <coughs> and what happened in uh, Williams is that uh, there was a truck that had a some sort of a, an accident in terms of it got heated and the uh, canola spread over quite a long bit of the highway there and of course when that area was tested a lot of the canola growing on the roadside is actually GM. Uh, now the responsibility for that cleanup interestingly enough rests with the Shire uh, and the Shire doesn't want to know about it um, and uh, the challenge with it is that it because it's uh, GM canola, you can't spray it with Roundup, it doesn't kill it. So they have to use more significant um, uh, chemicals to kill a GM uh, a crop because it's, um, it's its whole feature. You can spray the whole thing with Roundup and kill off all the weeds uh, and the canola keeps growing. So uh, yeah, that's that's been a uh, I mean, bound to happen. I don't know if everybody knows what canola looks like. What do you think of poppy seeds? Uh, they're very light, they're very small. If you talk to the farmers, the level of um, contamination or spillage from canola is very high. Unless you're going to have a kind of positively, um, almost like transport it in a tanker like you would a liquid, um, some of it will spill. Um, so, and unfortunately what the industry, that is the GM industry, knows and is totally cynical about is that once it starts to be in the environment, then everybody just goes, it's too late. You know, it's happened. What can we do? Uh, but I don't think it's too late yet. Um, and certainly if there was a change of government and the Labor Party got in, they still have maintained their um, anti-GM stand to their credit. And it, between our combined numbers, we could probably uh, reinstate that ban. Um, and I think the backlashes will continue and it'll come from other farmers uh, as much as from the consumers. Uh, and the other point we are tackling it from is that, uh, from a labelling point of view, from the consumer's point of view, to try in the federal arena to ensure that there's truth in labelling. So that there isn't any tolerance in terms of GM content. It's got any GM content that has to be labelled in that way. But we know in products, you know, whether it's uh, corn syrup or soy products, that, that, that there is a GM uh, tolerance, which is especially in imported stuff. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, I suppose just touching on, I thought the FBC and plantation of hardwood or of saw logs was interesting. We asked a question earlier on this year, and I think it was what it was to do is um, I raised it, it was to do with now that we've got bushfire rating zones, we're having to use um, timbers that are, are regarded as bushfire resistant. And at, at the moment, there are no WA timbers which are bushfire resistant. So the common one used now is um, a timber called spotted gum, which we get from the eastern states. And spotted gum is actually a plantation timber, and we were growing it in WA. I think if, uh, I can't recall the year 2007. Uh, they st stopped funding the FPC plantings in about 2008. I think. 2008. So we, we had a potentially a growth industry there, um, saw log industry. Uh, the farmers could have uh, gained a, a cash crop. Um, uh, growing uh, uh, spotted gum, and they were keen to do so, uh, and the FPC had stopped it. And so basically now we've got this hole where a period now where no, none of these species have been planted, and so the capacity to actually transition from native logging to um, plantation timber is, um, has been weakened because of that. And it's not, I suppose, if you look at the argument, it's not an argument of whether um, should we log in native forests or shouldn't we? The time is coming where we won't be because the timbers just aren't there. And we're hearing stories now of, you know, one, one uh, load came through of 70% rejection. Um, plus we've got the issue of climate change where especially our northern Jarrah forests are getting 
absolutely uh, caned by the lack of rainfall. And I suppose to put it into context is that uh, Jarrah's usually grow in a, a rainfall of around 600 millimetres per year. Now, at Cape Naturalist, we average about 840 mil a year up until about two th year 2000. In the last 12 years, we've averaged 640 and we're falling. So the scope of area where Jarrah's are going to possibly survive in the future is diminishing rapidly. So it's, if you were to look at the industry and say, if you were in that industry and you said, you want a future, logging Jarrah in native forests is on a short leash as far as time goes, and they need to transition out of it. And at the moment, they've got their head in the sand and they're choosing not to. Yet, you've got the agricultural industry wanting to take on that role. Um, and the government just not being proactive in making sure that transition comes about. Yeah, the um, the FPC's role was to um, uh, to Forest Products Commission, so they um, uh, managed the logging of native forests as well as they did manage plantations. They still have a role in the pine plantations, but what they stopped doing is funding any planting activity. And of course, if you're going to develop an on-farm uh, timber industry, you need to have a consistent supply. So there was plantings that took place over 10 years, um, a fair chunk of federal money was also introduced to do that, and the, in fact the spotted gums are doing very nicely having been out and um, walked around the, with the Forest Products uh, Commission, um, but as soon as they stopped planting in 2008 you've kind of got a gap in your, uh, your, you know, your, your product as it, as, it, as it becomes to uh, maturity, you made that move to uh, decline those leases, yeah. but the companies still have, still own, you know, they're still sitting there, they haven't disappeared anywhere. Um, and, and those who follow the regular emails from Brent Watson, who <laughs> did a fantastic job on that campaign, you know, that that's still sitting there. Uh, and if you had a change of attitude by a future mining minister, it could be changed overnight. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like when uh, the Liberals got in and uh, changed overnight their position on uranium mining by a stroke of a pen. Uh, so it doesn't have to go through Parliament, it doesn't have to be debated or anything, it could just be changed. Uh, whether they've got the political kind of gumption to do that, we don't know. But, uh, and one of the ongoing issues down there, of course, you own land within that coal, coal mining area. Um, the ability to get loans, and that is really restricted because the banks look at it and say, well, you the can't. value of your land is actually plummeting because it could be mined at any time. There's this element of unsurety about its future, mm -hmm. which is actually making its life really difficult for yeah. a few of the people down there. The capacity to borrow money to pursue their agricultural. Mm -hmm. um, What's the term that Brent called that? Decapitalising yes. or something? Yeah, I can't remember. It's like if your neighbour moved in and did something that completely trashed the value of your house and you've got no recourse. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Okay. On that note, if it's yeah. oh, scary, yeah. and um, if we don't start planning and doing it now, um, we are going to be, you know, really behind the eight ball um, in terms of water. Uh, so. Uh, Is there still a risk in Boston of the, um, the mining coal seam? Coal, oh, coal seam gas. So with fracking is um, in this area because of the Sioux coal seam, which runs basically from Siesta Park right through down to Augusta. Um, that's coal seam gas. Um, Titan Energy did have, uh, still have leases. Um, we're going to do exploration, but we've actually pulled out now. So at this stage, no. Um, I suppose that draws on to another discussion about um, protection of agricultural and tourist areas from whether it be coal seam gas and fracking and from mining. Um, at the moment, uh, Margaret Cole's not going ahead because the minister has said, um, we won't proceed with that, but that's the only protection we've got. So if we get a, we are getting a new minister actually in the next election because Norman Moore is retiring. We've just got to rely on that minister to uphold that um, rejection of uh, mining mm. in, in Margaret River. Now, coal seam gas and fracking actually come under the Petroleum Act, which is a different act to the Mining Act. So um, yeah, look, there's a whole. There's a whole discussion and Giz introduced legislation into the Parliament with regards to what's called the Mining Community Protection um, Amendment Bill. And what it was was to give local councils the, op the capacity to their town planning schemes to override the Mining Act. So what could happen is, a, say, City of Boston would say, look, 
Margaret River, oh sorry, the Yelling Up Dunsborough area and right through to Carvenup is too precious as an agricultural area and a tourist area and we want to maintain it like that. Therefore, we put that in our town planning scheme and you can't mine it. At the moment, the mining act takes precedence. So they can go down there and mine it and the councils might have it zoned as, you know, tourist and we'll have a mine there. And everyone should watch that video. I can't remember the Gas name, but Gas the Americans. Yeah. Gas lane. Yeah, yeah. yeah. they so, really so, should yeah. know exactly what happened. So in WA, Margaret River is probably one of the few areas where, where coal seam gas fracking was a possibility. And at the moment, for commercial reasons, it's probably been pushed off as a chance now. But certainly, it's only the um, financial aspect of it and whether they find a, a lucrative seam or not to and do And I it. reckon they've got to get yeah. in quick because they will ban it. And yeah. if they don't yeah. get in quick and There's get a bit their of that little happening. holes yeah. Yeah. drilled, and, but in the Perth Basin, up in the over there is actually, um, it's not coal seam gas, it's um, shale, shale gas, gas. Um, and they're fracking for shale gas up there. And it actually happens quite close, up at the Witcher Range, um, they pumped over a million litres of diesel into the um, wells up there oh. when they fracked, and that's down there, they didn't get it back. Um, it, and actually I've spoken to the current Witcher Range energy people, and they're planning to do more work up there, but they're not fracking. And the problem they had up there was because it was, um, there's clay in the, uh, it's tight gas up there it's called, it's very dense, and there's, and there's a bit of clay in the rock formations. When they fracked, the clay expanded and just shut it all down. So and so they wrecked it. They actually they destroyed their well by fracking it. So the new guys going in, to their credit, uh, they, they won't refuse to frack it again. But I, I don't know what stage they're at or what they've got planned up there at the moment. Look, I said, I the thing that that was that was the well, I haven't noticed that with price on carbon that he, he's uh, made any changes. Um, but Michael's right. I mean, and again, out in the farming community, um, if, if there is a relatively small amount of assistance, there are a lot of farmers who are looking to diversify their income, uh, to uh, actually... Um, set up a local industry like a sawmill in Cranbrook or one of those sort of areas where a lot of that planting has occurred to uh, make good sawn timber or good quality uh, um, mm -hmm. laminate and that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, unless you've got a critical mass you can't actually start putting in the infrastructure mm -hmm. and it hasn't got to that critical, critical mass yet. I think yeah. the farmers too don't know what to do, to tree or go back to farming. Well, and a lot of them are in so much serious debt that it's, it's really hard. And again, you know, some of the things that we've been looking at is the kind of big picture stuff like the role of the big supermarkets in terms of determining prices. That's what, apart from the deregulation that occurred in the dairy sector, mm -hmm. those that have managed to stay in there are now being hammered by this uh, price war between yeah. coals and yeah. waters. And um, I've also been speaking to um, this woman called Sue Middleton, who's a very inspiring uh, farmer out at Wongan Hills, actually, but she uh, won an Australian you know, Rural Woman of the Year award a couple of years ago, and trying to uh, diversify their product. They grow pigs and they grow oranges, I think they grow olives or something like that. And she said their biggest impediment is the major supermarkets, because they won't um, allow them to differentiate their product. They just want masses of stuff at the cheapest amount. So there are structural things that are making it hard for even the farmers who are trying to, um, you know, she's growing like organic pork, uh, they, 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 the big buyers, the big retail buyers, uh, don't want a differentiated product, they just want lots of, you know, what they can sell cheaply. So there's a real kind of battleground out there in terms of what farming is going to look like in, in Western Australia. Uh, and I think, you know, farmers are, you know, they, are really uh, looking for an alternative kind of uh, direction than what's being offered by uh, by the nationals, actually, in terms of a kind of a get big or get out argument. I think it's very important needs an ABC of agriculture, like ABC television, you know, separate media, government media, and we need government agricultural department shopping centre outlets as well, maybe. Mm. It doesn't help that the department has been cut heavily in terms of its. Uh, uh, budget cuts and uh, the morale in the Department of Agriculture and Food is very low. 
um, and uh, uh, they only have prospect of more of the same. And in some respects, it's kind of also a victim of the, uh, of the, the, the split economy, the mining economy versus everything else. Um, and so they lose people to the mining sector, then they get you know, cuts, and so it's a very emaciated organisation. It's more or less a marketing arm, which is only part, I mean, nothing wrong with marketing, it's an important part of the thing, but it's only part of it. On, on agriculture, I suppose everyone's familiar with deregulation of the milk industry, and the fact that now that farmers are getting less at the farm gate for their milk than they And not only that, this, WA is no longer even supplying or producing enough of its own milk for its own market now. Um, so that's been a, a real tragedy. Um, and that's been forewarned for, year, for a couple of years now, and it's now actually starting to happen where we're importing milk because we're not producing enough locally. Yeah, and it wasn't that long ago. The, Sorry? That's all the dehydrated and reformed yeah. low fat, all this mm. stuff that's really bad. And it wasn't long ago we were looking at the dairy industry actually being a, an export industry. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, well, and the other factor happening yeah. there, Michael, of course, is the mm. is the buying up by Chinese uh, yeah. uh, companies. Yes. And all, you've got to remember, all Chinese companies are actually at least partially government owned, yeah. so they're like the Chinese government. And then uh, the uh, pressure to produce powdered milk to export yeah. a direct chain just straight through to. I think it's a, it's, it's a pretty fast-moving and extraordinary mm. times and, yeah. uh, you know, again, the, the Minister has basically said you um, shouldn't be afraid of foreign investment, it's all good. Um, and interestingly enough, some farmers have been quite, on the one hand this and the other hand that about it, because at least someone's injecting capital into, the, into their, uh, their assets. They're providing a, an alternative um, purchaser of yeah, their milk other than the cold yeah. worse. But also in terms of yeah. buying the properties, they're stabilizing, yeah, yeah. Out, oh, true, stabilizing yeah. out the kind of crash in the value of, of farming yeah. properties. Yeah. So, and but. The, yeah. And the <laughs> next one cost? is um, deregulation of the potato industry is coming up in this election too. The Labor have said they want to deregulate the potato mm -hmm. industry. Um, which actually puts the Greens in a, a power position on this one because I was, when I was speaking to a potato farmer about it, he says, oh, it's a formality the industry will be deregulated. And I said, well, no, it won't. Because Labor will never, I can't see in any time in the future, Labor getting into power in this state and having control of the upper house. The Greens will have the balance of power. So the Greens are in a, posi in a position to actually dictate terms in deregulation of the potato industry and attempt to prevent those problems which have gone into the, uh, the dairy industry. So that's an interesting Interesting one coming up too. On the Giz mentioned earlier about the effort to showcase businesses that are really thriving and doing well and, and that are sustainable ones. And the, uh, while you're while we're discussing dairy, the, the amazing story of, of Bannister Downs milk. Okay, so the hot, as we know, the dairy crashed everywhere. Um, Bannister, meanwhile, is selling their milk top dollar. They do not budge on price, and they are thriving. And they, 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 they're the ones in the, in the soft pouch. Mm -hmm. They have this, uh, they, they manage their dairy in, a, in a, an organic, holistic way and, and the milk's great and everybody loves it and they're, they're doing very nicely, thank you very much. We buy it. So they're, they're, yeah, we buy it too. So it, it's a great example of, 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 of a green enterprise and you know, it's the way of the future. So the, they're the only people making money in the dairy industry. Really. Yeah. Are the top end products that are, or in all the niche markets that are in the cheeses and so on, especially on the south coast, and and they're doing quite nicely. So yeah, it can be done. Yeah, good to see. One I didn't touch on too is um, the container deposit scheme. I think that's mm. one where mm. it needs to kick along. Um, south Australia have it in. Yeah. Um, keep hearing stories about people coming from South Australia and they don't see near or any of the rubbish they see on the roads and beaches we see here. Um, that's that's a. It was actually uh, legislation was put forward in the federal parliament and knocked back by um, Liberal and Labor Party. Mm -hmm. And we've Why did actually. They knock it back. What did they the, pressure, the pressure of the um, of the packaging industry. Mm -hmm. Very powerful. They, they are incredibly powerful. Yeah. Um, now who is that? It's Vizzy, isn't it? Yeah, Vizzy. Their packaging company. And Have you ever seen their trucks? They've got a great big picture of a rainforest on the side. <laughs> I just go, oh! <laughs> <laughs> no, probably Coca-Cola Amatol are the main... Uh, They're probably the biggest ones. Because yeah. Northern Territory is... And Vizzy. 
um, okay, yeah, parts of Northern. Well. Sorry? Yeah. This is yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Northern Territory introduced, I think it was some areas in Darwin, or well, Darwin might have introduced um, a container deposit scheme, and Coca Cola have taken the court. Really? Yeah, just trying to close them down. And the South Australian government actually fought various attempts to close them down, including attempts to bulk truck um, containers into the state from other states just to try and wreck their yeah. system. Um, they've managed to hold it up. Um, WA is in a great position where, because we've got South Australia doing it, we don't have that risk. Um, uh, but we're not interested in doing it. The WA, I'm not sure you've seen the, um, the ads in our local paper where the local government association put full page ads assessing uh, different parties' policies and we've given the Greens big ticks on each item and one of those is container deposit scheme. And the reason being is that um, glass in the waste stream is really costly for local government. One, it goes in a landfill, but also it contaminates their um, recyclables. So when they go and assess their recyclables, of course if it's dumped in the back of the truck, it's smashed up and all of a sudden they're trying to work through their recyclables with all this broken glass through their recycle. So again, it's, it's part of, if you have that container deposit scheme, remove all the aluminium and the glass out of the system and all of a sudden the recycling actually becomes more viable. So there's a few, few hits in Can I just throw in there too? I mean, it is one of the things that we do uh, really well is working with local government. Uh, we recognise that local government has some really significant roles to play and our relationship with you know, WA Local Government um, Association is really good. Um, and the recycling is one, but also you reminded me um, some of the um, changes that are happening in terms of a lot of uh, um, cost saving and energy saving with introduction of solar on things like the Bunbury Sports Complex has just Hello. in the last six months put in a, a solar system mm -hmm. on its roof um, and it is uh, an extraordinarily efficient um, a solar hot water system uh, and yeah. I've now been talking to the Mandurah um, well, Council, the Albany Council about similar um, enterprises and they've been kicked along because in the federal parliament, when the package went through with the Greens and the ALP for price on carbon, there was these additional uh, provisions around that. And one of that was to provide funds for local councils to um, do energy saving and greenhouse reducing projects. So they're doing two main things, seem to be putting solar on their all their heating or swimming pools and sports complexes were actually quite a big chunk of, of, uh, of money and also greenhouse gas. Uh, and changing street lights to LEDs. Um, and uh, in fact, the person who kind of did a lot of the work in WA Local Government Association uh, left and is now working for one of my colleagues, Robin Chappell. So we've got a really good you know, basis to work with local councils supporting their applications um, and that kind of thing. So, you know, there are some things changing uh, with that link between what we'll be able to do in the federal parliament and what's happening with local authorities. And it's, it'll actually save ratepayers too. So yeah. people will start to see, oh yes, this price in carbon actually might save us on our rates. Uh, you know, they, in fact, Bunbury, the, the, what they're seeing is that the, uh, uh, the estimated um, saving has already been eclipsed. Uh, quite considerably, so it's pretty exciting, really, and it's kind of a no-brainer, actually. <laughs> you know, why would you heat your massive swimming pools with uh, with electricity rather than using photovoltaic? Um, well, it's not photovoltaic; it's thermal yeah. technology. Yeah. Well, Dunsford Primary School, we've transferred all our lighting across to LEDs, okay. and um, yeah, we'll be doing some work on the numbers to see how much money we're saving, but we're expecting to save more than eight to ten thousand a year um, just by making that move. And they have to get these stories out there, yeah. so people know that yeah. this is actually it's, it's actually a win-win, not a not a terrible impost on us. Yeah. Uh, you know, but but often people don't know these these sort of uh, uh, good news stories.